This week on the other side, finally, Extinction Rebellion cops a taste of its own medicine as a judge blocks their free movement for a while, tripling a serial pest protester's jail time. Hooray. Donald Trump has some bad news for his critic Kevin Rudd this week, and another former Labor Prime Minister seriously embarrasses the Albanese government and the nation. We'll tell you about that. The Aussie actress who says she's abandoning Australia for becoming a woke nanny state. A complete disaster for the Labor Party in Queensland elections this week as the Greens surge will explain simply and clearly what actually happened. The Victorian Liberals in a mess again. Tasmania goes to the polls and elbows kick in the guts for overworked, exhausted small business owners. G'day Darwin, g'day Ipswich, and g'day Tassie, and welcome Australia. This is episode 306 of The Other Side for the weekend commencing Friday, March 22, 2024. I'm Damien Curry. This is the show that is pretty much detested by every major political party in the land. The Greens absolutely loathe us, Labor hates us, and the Liberal Party can't stand us. That's because we're only concerned with one thing, and that's holding them to account and ensuring that you and we get as close to the truth as we can, given the limited resources that we have. Which, compared to them and their ABC, is precisely about 10 million times smaller. We do have an editorial bias on this show, and that is totally okay, because everybody does. What's wrong with them is that they don't admit it, and they claim to be neutral. We don't lie like that. And we declare our bias up front. We are old-fashioned, conservative-leaning, classical liberals. Nothing weird, nothing crazy, just classical liberal conservatives. We do not believe that everything new is better than everything old. We do not believe that times are necessarily better now in every way, or that people's lives are more fulfilled, healthier and richer in the truest sense of that word than they used to be. We believe that the last 150 years of history have sort of proven through a few really bad trials that socialism, big government and high tax do not work as a combination and they lead to authoritarian hell and murder by the state eventually. And we believe that free people acting freely in a free market and free society will always achieve the best results for everyone, especially the poor. We don't believe in forced equality or equity imposed by some big government rule makers because that is a recipe for disaster, poverty and everyone becoming equal, all right, equally poor and equally miserable. We're OK with hierarchy. In fact, hierarchy is the natural order of things. Hierarchy is good and hierarchy is often very just and right if it's based on merit, experience and a proven track record of skill and success. And there's no system on earth better than free market capitalism for sorting that out correctly and efficiently most of the time. And that is probably why a large minority of people, minority but large, uh, still hate capitalism, despite its repeated proven success. Oh well, some people will just never learn. The problem is that you'll find most of these people that will never learn in government escaping the very capitalist system that forces them to be truly accountable to the customers and clients that they're supposed to serve. Well, it's been the week of the giant egos of the former Labor Prime Ministers, hasn't it? These guys that just can't stay out of the limelight in dignified retirement. Coming to the fore in the news once again. Paul Keating wins the award for the worst performance of the week. Desperate for relevance and somehow ever the apologist for the Chinese Communist Party, Keating had a meeting with the visiting Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi in Sydney this week, a move that he must have known played right into the hands of the Chinese government. Keating should never have agreed to that meeting because it embarrassed his own party, the government of Anthony Albanese and Australia itself in a way. Wang Yi and his government were clearly playing games and meddling in our domestic politics trying to give kudos to those within the Labor Party who support China more than those who don't, and to send that signal to the Labor Party loud and clear. Not nice. Meddling. 
and very unpleasant of Paul Keating to enable that little game. Wang Yi's visit and official meeting with Penny Wong was supposed to be a step to normalising relations with China after the difficulties we've had in recent years. But it leaves one asking, can we ever normalise relations with a communist regime that just seems to want to exert power over us all the time and play silly games, rather than be an open, transparent, fair and friendly goodwill partner? Meanwhile, the ghost of that other, desperate for attention and relevance, former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd arose in an interview between UK, UK TV cable news channel GB News host and Brexit political leader Nigel, Nigel Farage and Donald Trump that aired exclusively in Australia on Sky News this week. Farage posed a question to Trump about whether he could work with Rudd, given the many horrible things that Rudd has said about him in the past. It's not entirely clear that Trump even knew who Farage was talking about. We've also got China to think about, and our friends at Sky News Australia wanted me to ask you this. The AUKUS deal that's in place on nuclear submarines, America, you know, the UK, Australia, very, very important deal. It's there to try and combat that huge growth, naval growth in China. But now, of course, things have changed in Australia. We've got a Labour government in Australia. The previous ambassador, Joe Hockey, I think was quite a good friend of yours. You got, you got on pretty well with him. Now they've appointed Kevin Rudd, former Labour MP. I mean, he has said the most horrible things. You're a destruct, you were a destructive president, a traitor to the West. And he's now Australia's ambassador in Washington. Yeah, well, I don't know. Would you take, would you take a phone call he from won't, him? He won't be there long if that's the case. I don't know much about him. Uh, I heard he was a little bit nasty. Uh, I hear he's not the brightest bulb. But I don't know much about him. But if uh, if he's at all hostile, he will not be there long. I actually feel sorry a little bit for Penny Wong this week. She had to defend Rudd. Does this show that it was a mistake or at least very risky for the government to appoint uh, Kevin Rudd as ambassador, given his comments were well known and Donald Trump had already declared his candidacy at the time? And secondly, uh, will the government keep uh, Kevin Rudd as ambassador if Donald Trump returns to the White House? Uh, uh, in relation to the latter, the answer is yes. In relation to the former, what I'd say is this. Even Mr Dutton uh, has expressed confidence uh, in Mr Rudd. Uh, Mr Rudd is a very effective ambassador. He is recognised uh, as doing, across this parliament, as doing, parliament is doing an excellent job in advancing Australia's interests in the United States. And I'd point you in particular to the phenomenal amount of work which has been done uh, on AUKUS in the period that he's been ambassador. Uh, he's been extremely active uh, in engaging with members of Congress on both sides of politics. Uh, and uh, he is you know, a former prime minister, a former foreign minister. Uh, his experience and skills mean he will be able to work closely with whomever is elected by the Australian, by the American people as the United States president. No, I'm not buying it. It won't be possible for Australia to have an ambassador that has so publicly bad mouthed the president. Rudd's future in that job, no matter how experienced he might be, is tied very much to the success of Joe Biden or whoever the Democrat candidate is on November 5. Apart from Donald Trump's light bulb moment, my favourite other story this week was the one in which the climate protester in Melbourne, who'd copped a 21-day jail sentence for obstructing traffic on the Westgate Bridge in one of Extinction Rebellion's idiotic street protests, had her and her partner's appeal thrown out and her jail time tripled. Hooray for the courts actually starting to reflect the reasonable expectations of the public. You see, this protest put people's lives at risk. Here's how ABC News reported it two weeks ago. The morning peak hour commute almost brought to a standstill as the climate change activists sent a signal. We are asking the government and all levels of society to declare a climate and ecological emergency. Hours of delays for motorists stretching back for many kilometres. Any sympathy for the cause was quickly drowned out by anger. After two hours, police used a cherry picker to remove the protesters, charging them with a range of offences. 
Two of the trio, Brad Homewood and Violet Coco, have a history of activism, detained on a number of occasions while protesting climate change. In 2022, Violet Coco was handed a prison sentence for a similar protest, blocking the Sydney Harbour Bridge. It's worth disrupting a little bit of traffic, a little bit of traffic to save humanity. So Violet Coco got charged along with her friend Brad Homewood, then was let out on bail and was right back protesting again, which those champions of law and order and good citizenship over at Channel 10's The Project Nightly Wokefest thought was just hilarious. Take it away, Rove. Violet, you're out on bail for your last road stunt, but <laughs> by the looks of things, you're straight back into it. Tell me why. Well, we've got a planet to save. Great, thanks for your time, Violet. Um, no, but is, it, is this a tricky thing, though? Like, I, I would think you would not be allowed to be doing this, or do I not have the provisions of your bail down properly? Well, the condition of my bail is not to unlawfully block a road, so because we have a right to protest, um, I can still march on the road or disco dance, as I will be later on tonight. As you can see behind me, uh, they're practising disco obedience. And, uh, and, yeah, I will be joining in because, you know, we need to be staying alive, which is the song that we'll be dancing to. Oh, right, staying alive, get it? Yeah, oh, they're so clever, aren't they? A police prosecutor did oppose your release. He said that, well, they said that your Westgate Bridge protest put lives at risk. Do you agree? I think that we put as many um, safety measures as we could into our action planning, knowing that there were hospitals on both sides of the bridge. Are you worried about going back to prison? Yes. What would stop you? What would prevent you, do you think? Um, if I had a report from a climate scientist saying that we had changed the trajectory and that we had a livable planet to continue on with for our kids, then I would stop protesting. But you're prepared to go back? I'm prepared to do whatever it takes to protect uh, the life, livable planet, yes. No. You don't get to do that, Ms Coco, and you'll have to learn that you have every right to protest in a free society, however you like, but not in a way that you choose only in ways that don't block emergency services access to more than a dozen call outs, which is what happened in Melbourne, and mean that mothers have to give birth on the side of the road, which is what happened in Melbourne, because they couldn't get to hospital. Yeah, that actually happened. Violet copped a 21 day jail sentence along with her partner, Brad, and then tried to appeal that this week to get it reduced to just community service. The judge, was having none of it, as Seven News reported. Two Westgate Bridge protesters are facing extra time behind bars tonight after an appeal backfired on them. They've just been told their 21-day sentence will be doubled for the traffic chaos that caused a nightmare for emergency services, delaying more than a dozen calls for help. Deanna Violet Coco came to court hoping to have her jail sentence overturned. No peaceful protesters should see the inside of a prison cell. Instead, a court doubled it. When she and her partner Brad Homewood blocked the Westgate Bridge, the traffic chaos held up three ambulances responding to emergencies. That included a couple forced to give birth beside the Western Ring Road. So it was showing me like more than one hour to get to the hospital. Channel 7 News there. Deanna and Brad will now spend two months in jail instead of three weeks. Bravo to that judge. Maybe they'd like to appeal again, perhaps. Speaking of left-wing fanatics, we have a massive problem in Australia, in our inner cities and with people under 35. Despite the Greens candidate for the recent Brisbane City Council election literally calling for shoplifting and squatting to be made acceptable and ethical and normalised in our society, People in the inner city suburbs of Brisbane still voted green in terrifying numbers. In the inner city Brisbane electorate of the Gabba, which covers West End and Woolloongabba, think Fitzroy, Newtown, Northbridge, you get the idea, inner city grunge, hipster vibe, the Greens' primary vote was absolutely off the charts at 45.4%. Now just let that sink in for a minute. That's almost half the people who live in that area walked into a polling booth and put a one next to the Nutter party. 
And Brisbane really is no different to any other Aussie city in this respect. It's just that in other places, there's more teal than green, but generally the same values. What will it take for people to wake up to the fact that firstly, the Greens are radical socialists and communists, and secondly, that socialism is not a good thing? Before you just dismiss this as inner city flakes and lefty kids, think again, half. That's not a big percentage, it's huge. That is literally every second person, right? And these suburbs are also where a lot of the corporate and government managerial class live. And have a look at this from the more affluent Brisbane area of Paddington, also in a city, but a much wealthier vibe, which the Greens have just won for the first time. Almost 40% primary vote and a comfy 51% after preferences kicked in from Labor to get them over the line. So, Seal chong -wa, who put at the top of her bio the following sentence, I am Eurasian, a proud woman of color, and I was adopted at six weeks old. I was fortunate to be raised with a mix of European, Australian, and Chinese cultures by two loving parents. whoop de doo I mean, my kids are Eurasian, I'm mixed race. What the hell's that got to do with your ability or suitability to be a city councillor? Ah, but for the woke kids, it's all that matters. Never mind the silly superficial stuff like, oh, I don't know, experience at anything. She goes on. I currently work in IT and have studied a bachelor's degree in visual arts, majoring in illustration at the Queensland College of Art. Right, and so, you know, being a counselor, anything, administration, management, anything where you, you sort of had to run a big thing, like, I don't know, a city. She goes on, I enjoy teaching music to my two kids and, having a passion and have a passion for singing and playing guitar, piano and violin. I've also enjoyed performing in an electro band in Brisbane's live music scene. Oh, God help us. I became active in politics, she says, due to my frustration with the government's lack of action on the climate crisis. My heart goes out to people who were impacted by the 2022 floods and all previous severe events like everything that's ever happened before ever to anyone, my heart goes out. We need Brisbane City Council to do so much more, she says, to prepare and protect our communities. Do we? Do we really need more government? I think they do a fine job at Brisbane City Council, but I think it's enough. Stop spending money before you've even got in the council chamber seal, really. You voted for this woman, Paddington with those credentials. Nothing wrong with loving your kids and wanting to play music and being an artist, it's all fabulous. But we are voting for councillors here. And there were a few other districts that also ended up with their very own seals because of the ignorant, foolish, childish way that too many people insist on voting in this country. We reap what we sow, Australia. We have a democracy, but it is incumbent upon us, the adults in the room with a brain to lead and guide and teach the young and the older fools around us who haven't grown up yet of the serious dangers of voting this way. We're failing in our role as parents and leaders and mentors in this country. Investment capital has even gone woke. What little money isn't controlled by leftist superannuation funds is being spent on corporate ESG and DEI nonsense. All the money's just gone, hiding overseas somewhere probably. But God knows it's not supporting the right media and education and cultural or church initiatives in Australia. We are losing the plot. So if you're a wealthy boomer and you want to keep your money from the tax man and these lunatics, you need to cough up and start funding and sponsoring the right things. And if you can and are fit and able, you need to get to work volunteering to change this garbage. Mentor a young person, talk to your kids and grandkids, give them books, podcasts, teach them about economics and liberalism and capitalism, because we are in serious trouble if the Greens overtake Labor as the dominant left party in this nation. Some people say I'm too preachy on this show. That's going to be preachy. Sorry, needs to be preached. Here's a fun reminder from a recent show of how dangerous these people can get. The Greens have fielded a candidate for Lord Mayor, a guy called Jonathan Sriranganathan, and Brisbane is a big green town. All three federal electorates covering central Brisbane are green. People like green things. They like nature and the environment. 
They just don't realise that the Greens' political party isn't green, it's red. It's a watermelon, green on the outside only. And Jonathan Sree, as he used to be known before he changed his name, is as red as red can be. A public guide to breaking the law. Honestly, I think it's better that people take the time and work out whether a home is actually empty. Councillor for the Gabba, Jonathan Triranganathan, taking a different approach to address Brisbane's housing crisis, sharing on social media a how-to for squatters, encouraging people to break into empty homes. That clip was part of a story from Channel 7 News Brisbane just over a year ago. Triranganathan said he was just trying to draw attention to the housing crisis. He wasn't actually encouraging people to squat. Ah, OK. Just like the time he said that shoplifting from Coles or Woolies was OK. A position that he hasn't backed away from, repeating as recently as October in this interview with Brisbane's Radio 4BC's Peter Gleeson. Just in Woolies and Coles, not in IGA small businesses. If that, you can't afford to eat. That's yeah. the most irresponsible thing I've ever heard, Jono. Well, what I, what from, I said... From a prospective law mayor Canada. What I said was that if, if people are poor, they can't afford the rent, they're living below the poverty line, I think it is, it is ethically justifiable. That's anarchy, to, mate. No, it is ethically justifiable. That's anarchy. No wonder let, you're an anarchist. Let me finish. I, I think it is ethically justifiable if people who cannot afford to put food on the table, whose kids are going Break hungry, the law. shoplift. It's just... I. I mean, that was astounding enough, but after what happened last weekend with the election, 20% of people citywide in Brisbane voted one Greens after seeing that. 45%, as I said, in the Gabba ward, that seat, and 40% in Paddington, which is a wealthy area. You know, maybe it's not that people are mistakenly voting for them, thinking they're an environmental party. Maybe they know they're a socialist communist party and are voting for them anyway. If this philosophy of shoplifting as a perverted form of social security sounds familiar, it's not surprising. You may have seen this from our friends in America. You've seen the videos of brazen smash and grabs like these, okay. often carried out in broad daylight. It's an absolute threat. A Chicago area Louis Vuitton raided by 14 hooded suspects, making off with over $100,000 worth of luxury items a flash mob style heist at an Oakland area Nordstrom. This New York jewelry store, windows smashed in with hammers. Federal authorities and retailers are now sounding the alarm about the growing danger of organized retail crime that is sweeping the country. So that's, that's where it leads, so we want that. Okay, US ABC News Nightline show there in a story from late last year. New laws from radical left Democrat party run states making shoplifting small amounts of goods illegal. That's what caused that. The same policy that the Greens are promoting leads to massive organized crime. Authorities say organized retail crime is large scale theft of mostly high value items from handbags to power tools, which are often then illegally resold online on sites like Amazon, eBay, Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist. They're very much organized in the sense that they're doing it for the profit. Obviously, the prof prof profitability is the key here. Companies say this type of crime is reaching unprecedented levels, jumping more than 26% in 2021 and forcing the average family to pay an estimated $500 more each year on goods. Mm. That's basic economics, folks. Nothing is free. An idea that seems to escape the Greens and most of the left-wing thinkers generally who vote for them. But that's reality and no left-wing theories were going to change it. If people steal, someone has to pay somewhere the workers who lose their jobs, and the other customers who pick up the tab. And what happens if the crime continues and the law allows it? The shops close down and leave. That's what's happening in America. But try explaining this over a chai latte in West End to Glebe or Fitzroy to a genius green like Jonathan Sri Ranganathan, and you'll get called some neo-liberal right-wing nutjob. Okay, yeah, okay, we're the nutjobs. I got it, right. In some cases, employees fight back. This family-owned jewelry store in Huntington Beach, California, says they were targeted by thieves last year. It's our family business. We wanted to protect it, I guess, like protecting what's ours. But many larger retailers do not want their employees to intervene. Lululemon recently fired two employees for chasing no. alleged robbers, no. as seen in this video. Get out. Get out. 
the company saying in a statement the two women were fired for knowingly violating our zero tolerance policy related to physically engaging with the perpetrators, which put their lives and the safety of our guests and other employees at risk. Our people's safety is our number one priority. Home Depot also tells its employees not to stop robberies in progress, warning of the dangers. That's the USABC's Nightline program late last year. What a bright future the Greens have in mind for us. Here's an idea. How about enforcing the law and ensuring even minor shoplifting offences are punished so that the crime doesn't increase? We pay tax, we have social security, there are plenty of places people can go if they need help. But normalising shoplifting as a way to help the poor? No thanks. You see what these Greens don't get is that our society runs on a law and order platform that is very fragile. If you break it just a little bit, it can completely collapse. But we also run on a platform of unspoken rules of behaviour. The idea that what is yours is yours. The concept of the right to property ownership is the very cornerstone of free market capitalism. And that is the real reason that modern day Marxists like the Greens want to attack it so much. The right to own property, land, houses and stuff is what stimulates our system. It's why so many of us get up in the morning and go to work and produce the wealth that lifts the whole country up. If I told you, as socialists and communists like to do, that you must go to work every day and that we will take your money, the fruits of your labour, off you, or we won't let you get paid more than the next guy, no matter how much better at the job you are or how much more effort you try to put in or how hard you work, then what happens to your motivation? Same job, same pay, hey? Mm, may as well not bother putting in any extra effort then. May as well not bother starting a small business. May as well not bother creating any jobs or skilling up or getting extra education. May as well not bother investing in anything since the government will take ownership anyway eventually, take all my gains, etc., etc., etc. Honestly, history has already taught humanity this lesson time and time again in the past 200 years, and we just keep making the same mistake. People still keep voting for the party that sounds nice, that sounds caring, that feels nice. But we've got to be grown-ups. We have to engage our rational thinking brains, and we have to think more than just one step ahead. Every government intervention has consequences, both obvious and unforeseen and unintended. Will we ever get it? Now, one of the reasons that people don't get basic liberal economics in Australia is that the political party that's supposed to promote these ideas in this country through its policies and debate and the media is refusing to do its job. Instead of fighting the good fight, they play along with the left and allow the left to set the agenda on everything. They try to look more green and left than the left itself. This doesn't work, of course. The Liberal Party is out of government federally and in every state and territory in Australia, except one, Tasmania, where it has a minority government and a lot of outspoken former Liberals to deal with. The party was thrown into minority government by the resignations of two MPs over what they said was a lack of transparency regarding the government's deal with uh, the AFL in Melbourne over a Tassie team in the competition and the building of a new stadium. Premier Jeremy Rockliffe called an early election last month for this weekend to sort out those rebels. We do have a strong plan, which is all about addressing these important issues, but the parliament has become unworkable. I'm not going to allow myself or my government to be held to ransom for the next 12 months. It's bad for Tasmania and it's bad for Tasmanians. So I've taken the decision to call an election so that Tasmanians can have their say. He has a strong plan. And in case you didn't quite catch that message, here's a campaign video from the Tasmanian Liberal Party. All right, thanks for the cup of mum. Oh, I've got, uh, got something I've got to do. A lot's changed in the last 10 years, but one thing remains the same. Our hard work and dedication to the people of Tasmania. Here's to our 2030 strong plan for Tasmania's future.
<laughs> Authorised by P. Coulson, Liberal Hobart. He really does have a strong, a strong plan. Crop circles, really. What will they think of next? Anyway, the Labor Party in Tassie has also been split and in disarray to the point where the national leadership of the Labor Party had to step in. So it's going to be an interesting election to watch. If you're watching this show after Saturday, you'll know the result already. The state is also adding more politicians. Sounds like a dubious idea. The new parliament will have 35, not 25 members. That is a massive increase. <laughs> Please remember to follow us on Twitter, now X of course, TikTok and Instagram at Other Side Oz, that's A-U-S. And please smash the like, subscribe and every other button on all the platforms that you can. And please make comments, that also helps with the magical algorithms that control us all. Of course, the best place to join us of all is on ADH TV at adh.tv on any web browser and is absolutely free. And then you'll get all of ADH's other great content. Fred Paul, David Flint, Alexandra Marshall, Daisy Cousins, Spectator TV, Nick Cater, Church and State with Dave Pello, and all the special events that are up on ADH TV for you to watch on demand too. <laughs>
36. Victorian state Liberal leader John Pizzuto has had a writ filed against him by the British anti-trans women's rights activist known as Posey Parker. Parker, whose real name is Kelly J. Keane, has filed a statement of claim in the Victorian Supreme Court accusing Pizzuto of causing her, quote, substantial hurt, distress, embarrassment and fear for her safety and financial security, unquote. The Australian newspaper says fellow gender critical feminist activist Angela Jones is filing her own statement of claim against Pizzuto. These two latest actions come on top of the defamation case that's already being pursued by the expelled Liberal MP, Moira Deeming. Pizzuto dismissed speculation that this all might put his leadership under threat. There's been speculation about his leadership for several weeks now. The newspaper reports that Ms Keane is accusing Mr Pizzuto of wrongly portraying her as sympathising with neo-Nazis and right-wing extremists in comments that he made in a radio interview back when he was pushing to kick the newly elected MP deeming out of the Liberal Party after the Let Women Speak rally, which was held in Melbourne in March 2023 and was gatecrashed by neo-Nazis. It is women who can't describe what we are. It is pregnant women who go to hospital to be described as birthing persons. It is women in cancer literature described as people with cervixes. You testicular owners, you still get to be called men. You prostate checkers, you still get to be called men. It's not your language that's being destroyed and erased, it's ours. So I, I will ask your forgiveness. Not really, I, I don't care. Uh, but I will say that unashamedly, unapologetically, I will put women first. And that is every woman. The three women were organisers of that rally. The gate crashing by the neo-Nazis was not organised by them, nor was it welcomed in any way. Their focus was on the trans rights activists who turned out to shame them. Well, I'm glad Melbourne's media are here today to watch the two sides. Because whilst we're here just talking, about the things that we want, the rights that we need to protect. They're trying to break through police lines. What are they going to do? What do they want to do to us? Do, we, do they think we're going to be afraid? Many of us have pushed eight or nine pound babies through our vaginas. Some of you more crazy women will have refused any pain relief. You want to scare us, boys? You want to scare us? Tell us that you're cancelling chocolate. Ms Keane is also seeking damages from the ABC after a Sarah Ferguson interview on the 7.30 report with Mr Pizzuto, in which Ms Keane's lawyers say that she was associated with neo-Nazis in that interview by Pizzuto. That claim is being negotiated by the lawyers and may not go to court. <laughs> Small business copped a kick in the teeth recently. That's what small business needs right now. With the passing of Albo's new Fair Work Law amendments, there's a new definition of casual worker. According to employment lawyers at the law firm Baker McKenzie, when the changes come into effect, employers won't be able to rely simply on the terms and conditions of a contract to determine whether an employee is permanent part-time or casual. The practical reality of the working relationship could mean that the employee is not a true casual. To avoid getting into trouble, employers will need to periodically audit their casual arrangements to ensure they remain appropriate. Yeah, yeah, that's great if you're a big corporation, absolutely disastrous if you're a small business and want to have a couple of people to help out every now and again and don't have time for the micromanaging administrative BS of a meddling overintrusive government. I mean, it's all probably fair and makes perfect sense when you get into the nitty gritty. But honestly, who's got time for that when you're trying to run a small business and stay afloat? This madness of these petty bureaucrats has got to stop. I know heaps of wealthy Aussies who could be starting and growing businesses and employing kids and creating jobs and contributing to our economy. They've just given up. They can't be stuffed because of our petty bureaucrats and lawyers who suck off the productive members of our society. Liberal Party Senator Paul Scar rightly pointed out in Parliament a few weeks back that the Fair Work Legislation Amendment 
is going to impose yet another burden upon small business. There are over 2 million small businesses in Australia, and they employ 40% of all Australians who don't have an internal legal department in those small businesses to support them, like the big corporations do. Senator Scar pointed out that there are now 25 steps needed just to define the term casual employee. The small businesses who don't have hordes and hordes of lawyers ready to support them or multi-billion dollars of capital, the small businesses who are just hanging on by their fingernails. And I want to give you just one example of that, one example of how I think this legislation is going far too far. I think the issues that have been identified could have been addressed without going this far. And I want to give you one example of that. 25 steps of mental gymnastics for a small business who's hanging on by their fingernails to try and determine whether or not one of their employees is a casual employee. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to play you all 25 steps, but you get the idea. Let's just look at one step, though. And if you could follow this, folks, you're a genius. We've got to consider real substance, practical reality, true nature, and on the basis that a firm advanced commitment can be in the form of the contract of employment. OK, so I can look in my contract of employment. That's easy. That's step number three. But if it isn't in my contract of employment, I've got to go to step four, which is these words. Irrespective of the terms of the contract, in the form of a mutual understanding or expectation. So it's either an understanding or expectation between the employer and the employee not rising to the level of a term of a contract or to a variation of such terms. So it's, it's something nebulous. Yeah, it's something nebulous, all right. It's something to take a small business person away from their family and kids and life for another hour a week trying to work out. Honestly, get lost. Just get lost, the lot of you. Meddling, moronic bureaucrats in unproductive jobs, driving everyone else in the country who's trying to be productive utterly mad. Take your little rule books and shove them. We need to boot this government to high heaven. This over-governing nanny state insanity has got to stop or there'll be no jobs because there'll be no employers left. These sorts of ridiculous laws that don't exactly tell you what they require you to do or not do, but just leave you kind of guessing, remind me of that classic sketch by the brilliant Aussie comedian Carl Barron that's been doing the rounds on social media lately. Like you ask someone how they are in Australia, they don't tell you how they are. They tell you what they're not. And you've got to guess the rest. Okay, mate, how you going? Oh, not bad. <laughs> what have you been doing? Oh, not much. <laughs> Where is this place? Oh, it's not far. <laughs> when are we going? Oh, not long now. <laughs> how much was that, mate? Wasn't cheap. <laughs> this old bloke who lives next door to me, he only ever tells me part of a story. Saw so him the other day go, how you going, Johnny? He goes, not feeling too bloody good, mate. I'll tell you that much. you got to think about that last one a little bit. Carl Barron there. All right, I don't want to drown you in politics this week, but bear with me. I do want to go back to last week's Queensland local government elections for a bit. There's another important lesson for conservatives and classical liberals to take away from it all. It was a disaster for the Labor Party of massive existential proportions but a huge boost and a positive tick for the LNP. What's important is that the LNP take the right message from it, not the wrong one. Local council elections would normally be a big yawn outside the Sunshine State, except for two reasons this time around. Brisbane City Council is now the largest government held by the Liberal Party in Australia, governing 1.2 million people, half of Greater Metro Brisbane, and there were two state by-elections that were held at the same time as the local council elections, and those by-elections yielded unexpectedly bad results for the ALP. So these elections sent mixed messages to Queensland's United Liberal National Party, the LNP, which, if they are interpreted badly by the party's strategists, could lead them in completely the wrong direction in the upcoming state and federal elections we're going to have in the next year or so. The two state by-elections were caused by the resignations of two MPs. Former Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk, who previously held the outer southwestern Brisbane working class electorate of Inala, and the member for Ipswich West in the Labor Heartland satellite city to Brisbane's immediate west. 
The swing against Labor in Inala was around 30% against Labor's primary vote. And that can be kind of explained away by the loss of a prominent political figure like Palaszczuk. And it wasn't completely unexpected. Inala's been retained by the ALP, though. So strong was Palaszczuk's margin to begin with. But the story in Ipswich is disastrous for Labor. And for Palaszczuk's successor, Stephen Miles. Stephen Miles concedes his government faces wipeout in October if last night's by-election results are replicated statewide. In a horror night for the Labor Party, it looks to have lost the heartland seat of Ipswich West. I was expecting a bad result and they're even worse than that. That's how Nine News reported it. The swing against Labor in Ipswich West was 15% on the primary vote and almost 18% after you do the two-party preferred thing. That's absolutely massive. To put it in perspective, the recent Melbourne by-election in the federal seat of Dunkley was a slightly larger than average swing, but it was only 3 to 4%. So what does all this tell us? Well, the LNP had a very good night. With success in both the council elections, the Lord Mayor of Brisbane was returned and they might increase their council chamber uh, numbers despite the green surge in primary votes and Labor's existential crisis. And they had huge positive swings in both those state by-elections. But here's the rub. The good result in the council election and the good result in the by-elections were for two completely different kinds of reasons with two very different kinds of voters. And the ALNP strategists do have a tendency to like to apply what works in Brisbane City to state and federal elections because they think that Brisbane City Council is their big golden shining light of the party. And that is a huge mistake, one they need not to make in the state election in October this year like they did the last state election, nor should they make it in the federal election that's going to follow in the months after that one. The recent wins by libertarian and conservative non-left-wing parties around the world, especially in left-wing leaning Europe, has been heavily relied upon a rejection of modern leftist elitism by working class non-university educated people. This cultural and political split between inner metro and outer metro Australians was really writ large on Saturday in Queensland. The inner city university educated voters continued their long march to the Greens in the Brisbane City Council election. And this happened despite, as we said earlier, the radicalism of a Green Lord Mayoral candidate who'd openly called for squatting and shoplifting. The Greens collected almost 20% of the primary vote citywide. The Greens came worryingly close to victory in four of the Council's 26 seats. It looks like they're going to finish with just two, with nearly all their gains at the expense of poor old Labor. The LNP held on to power by playing a clever teal-like strategic game of being very green in their policies as a city council and in the way that they approach the election. But the state by-election results send a very, very different message with a different kind of voter. Out of city and satellite city voters, the good results for the LNP in Inala and Ipswich West make it clear that Peter Dutton's strategy of favouring the outer metro conservative working class who are struggling with the cost of living crisis, who are rattled by crime and who are fed up with cultural wokeism, is actually the right strategy. A firm focus on the issues that matter for the aspirational middle class rather than any ideological shift to the left to appease inner city elites like they had to do in the city election will be critical to succeed in the state and federal election. It's what caused the political isolation and decline of the Labor Party. The elite of the ALP are fixated on woke nonsense that's got nothing to do with the real concerns of people who are trying to bring up their families and pay the bills. So the message of Saturday for the Liberal National Coalition nationwide seems very clear. The pragmatic suburban green strategy of bikeways, parks and gardens will work in the inner cities, but any temptation to hold that Brisbane City Council as a shining template of how elections are won and try to apply that to a state and federal strategy is doomed to fail. The people who inhabit our outer suburbs are smart as a whip. They know inflation is caused by big government overspending and that high taxes will only worsen the problem. They understand the need to back small business. They reject all things woke and they hold traditional Australian family values. Focus on the outer suburbs and cities like Ipswich and Inala, where people are abandoning labour in droves, but are voting liberal, not green, instead. <laughs>
Follow us on Twitter X, TikTok, and Instagram at Other Side Oz. That's A U S. And please do smash the like, subscribe, and every other button on all the platforms that you possibly can. And please make comments. That also helps with the magical algorithms that control us. Of course, the best way to join us, as always, is every week here on ADH TV, ADH.TV on any web browser, and it is absolutely free. If you go to ADH TV, you sign up, you join us, then you get all our great content for free. Fred Paul, David Flint, Alexandra Marshall, Daisy Cousins, Spectator TV, Nick Cater, Church and State with Dave Fallow, and all the special events are up there. It's amazing the amount of content that's up there to watch. Uh, on demand anytime you like. We'll catch you next week on the other side. We drop a new show every Friday night at 8 p.m. on ADH First. I'm Damien Curry. Bye for now. <laughs>